Hi, and welcome to the Bitcoin Takeover podcast. My guest today is Chris DeRose, a man who was recommended to me by my guest from the previous season, Zach Paul. And he actually tagged Mr. DeRose on Twitter and said, you should totally join this discussion and have a dialogue with Vlad and discuss stuff about Bitcoin and how it's taking over the world. And then I, I got into learning about Chris and he calls himself a pseudo intellectual, but at the same time, he makes a lot more sense than people who call themselves intellectuals. So I have no idea how that works, but anyway, hello. Hello, thank you for having me on the show. That's a great introduction. I forgot that Zach put us in touch. Yeah, I put, uh, so I don't actually call myself a, a, a pseudo intellectual. Uh, I generally call myself uh, the terrible things. Uh, but I put that on my Twitter bio because I collected that Pokemon. Uh, somebody else called me a pseudo-intellectual who uses MS Paint. I thought it was hilarious, and so I, I, uh, I wore that as a badge uh, that I'd earned because I, I, it was an achievement. I unlocked it. I bet you no one's ever said that about you. Uh, a lot of stuff was said about me, but I, I tried to forget about it, even though it's the stuff that I think about the most when I try to sleep at night. Oh, that's not healthy. Yeah, you know how it works. You don't remember all the flowers and the good words, but you remember the mud that was thrown at you. You know, you got to remember, you're not a person to these people. You're, you're just like this hater object. And like the reason you're a hater object is probably something hilarious because, you know, you said that the, the, the bits that you prefer, uh, you prefer them arranged in this capacity and not in that capacity. And so they've, they've decided that you are the uh, enemy of all that is good and holy. It's really not worth keeping yourself up at it at night over. It's re really that dumb in many cases. So Chris or Mr. DeRose, I'm not sure how I should call oh, no, you. No, Chris, not Mr. Okay. How did you get into Bitcoin for the first time? So yeah, I saw it on uh, Slashdot as a post in 2011. And I thought it was interesting, but it wasn't until Silk Road came out that I realized it was useful. And that's when I really got in. So the Silk Road kind of gets the, the meat of it. So you had to see the use case of that weird invention that you have read about previously. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So did you buy anything on the Silk Road? Or uh, of course, you're not going to disclose it. But was it the time when you got into Bitcoin financially? Yeah, so I do I disclose a lot of these things. I, I did buy things on Silk Road, and uh, I bought uh, ketamine and I think two CB, two CI. Uh, I think I was I, I was I was like came out of the bar and I was kind of trying it out and uh, I, you know I, I started taking orders for people there. You know, like it was it was kind of like at the time it wasn't like I don't know that I thought it was even real, frankly. And uh, so you know, not, nothing like really terrible. I, I don't think. Um, and, uh, in today's age too, I think we're kind of like past the sort of like, uh, the shaming of these things. I don't, I don't know, maybe not, but like, just, I don't know that anyone cares about that anymore. Like I'm watching the ketamine make it into clinical trials and it's like very perverse to me that anybody, uh, wouldn't talk about it because like all that means is that you were like, I, I think, uh, performing medical research, uh, in hindsight. So that's okay. Uh, in any case, uh, yeah. So I, I, frankly, I, you know, I bought some Bitcoin too at the time. Uh, my official answer is that I, I hold one Bitcoin. I've always held one Bitcoin. And my official answer will always be that I hold one Bitcoin. And I, I advocate that be everyone's official answer. It's a good answer. Yeah, that, that's a fair amount to hold. There's a it lot is. of people yeah. in the world who should be holding one Bitcoin. Agreed. There's Absolutely agreed. 24 million of it. 21, sorry. Whoa, I, I just made the ultimate mistake. That's okay. We knew what you meant. <laughs> sure. So you got into 2011, and were you on the Bitcoin Talk forums? Yeah, I was. I was, and uh, I wasn't super active, um, but I was. And uh, it really, a lot of stuff happened on Skype. If you can believe it back then, and then IRC, um, and there wasn't a lot of content either. So it's not like today at all. And it was. It was very weird. At the time, it, you know, like people, people that are new think that this is how it's always been, I think, and it, it's not. It, it really is a shame that 
not everybody knows how it was in those early days. It was like it used to be that if you were creating a currency, you were an enemy of the state. And uh, at some point that changed completely. Uh, I don't know when. And uh, it was sometime between like, you know, e-gold in the late 90s and Bitcoin, I guess. Uh, but we, we didn't know that at the time. And, and then on top of that, everybody who uh, was a reasonable person told us we were completely insane and this was like a Ponzi scheme. And so we had to deal with a lot of that also back then. So you mentioned the idea of being an enemy of the state. And do you think that there is an ideological predisposition to be joining Bitcoin? Is there this element which makes you maybe a libertarian or an anarchist, which makes you much more willing to get into something which is not controlled by any government? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not an anarchist. I'm not a libertarian. Um, I, there are parts of the libertarian platform that I do like, but I like to just think I'm a, a conservative, like wrote. Uh, that's what I'd like to think. Um, others may label me otherwise. Um, yeah, you, you have to. Money is inherently ideological. I don't think you can separate money from ideology or faith in any capacity ever. You see that in this, you know, sound money paradigm that is often thrown around here, like this notion of the, of the soundness of the money, uh, it, which I, I interpret as an ideological compliance of the money uh, or the hardness, maybe. Um, these things are required because you have just a series of ones and zeros. And if it wasn't for the ideology, there would be nothing but ones and zeros. So you can't create a meaning without the ideology. That seems to be a necessary component of the money. And you see that with the dollar. The, the dollar you know, stamps God's approval on every bill. Uh, and other currencies do similar things. Um, I, I would argue that America is an ideology of, of a sort. And, uh, and these ideologies are what create any, any form of meaning to any technology. So I, I think that you have to have that here. Um, I like... Personally, the, the, the ideology that I've always liked, I think, in this space has been this sort of sci science fiction kind of, uh, classic science fiction kind of uh, perspective where you have this sort of the totalitarian, totalitarianism of the state as a suppressor force, and you have the individual who has not submitted to maybe the collective, but who uh, lives a life on the edge as a result of that and finds in this sort of renegade um, currency and an ability to eke out some level of uh, authenticity and um, hope, perhaps, against the machine. Yeah, that, for me, that's kind of what I've, I've wanted to see here. I, I don't know that I've always seen that, but that's, in my mind, the sort of uh, promise and potential that we have. Yeah, one of the perspectives that I personally like to have in terms of accepting Bitcoin and integrating in my way of life is that you can either try to fight the system from within and pursue a career in politics or in finance and try to change something according to your worldview, which is very unlikely, or you try to build a life of your own and be autonomous and embrace agency and try to discover something that complements the side of you. And when you do it, you put governments and everybody around you in a position of negotiation. If you hold any kind of asset that cannot be confiscated, then you automatically become, depending on the nature of your government, a criminal or somebody who has to be dealt with in a negotiating way. And luck, luckily for us, we live in democracies which are more or less consolidated and follow the procedures of rule of law and up to this point in time code, which is fundamentally what we hold. We hold access to something which is stored on a public blockchain and that kind of code has not been banned yet and running it is still something that is accepted. So I like to think that by getting into Bitcoin, Maybe that we're not going to change the world, we're not going to bring the next revolution, and we're not going to overthrow our governments. But the politicians are going to come to us and try to negotiate and make us contribute to the society in a way that before Bitcoin was invented was mandatory because they, they basically govern the financial system that brings the money. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. That's true. I, I would probably have said that I wanted Bitcoin to be a little more uh, revolutionary than you might have expressed, but otherwise, yeah. In which sense would you want it to be much more revolutionary? Well, you know, like we're, we're at this crossroads here, it seems like, um, at like the dawn of a new era, you know, the, the sort of automation era, I guess, or the uh, information age. And it's certain that the controls that we have on money are uh, really not in, in our favor as individuals. It's really in the favor of the corporation and in the state. And I would have liked to have maybe seen a reversal of power there more so than, than has been manifested thus far. Uh, or at least that would be my hope because I, I don't, every, you know, everybody in this space wants to hit the utopia. Everybody wants to win and, and dominate. And, and I, I've often been like that myself. I get it. Uh, but I think as I get older, I think I, I strive more for balance. You know, I, I think that a world where Bitcoin was the only currency would probably be terrible, honestly. Uh, and I, but I also think that the world we live in uh, where the dollar is, is so, uh, uh, restrictive of uh, commerce is also a little bit uh, undesirable. And we see that in, in many forms, um, yeah, things that I don't think we really have uh, accepted as, as being rather onerous, you know, things like uh, Patreon accounts being removed, which is not a Patreon issue. That's like a dollar issue. Um, and various restrictions of, of commerce as well. Like I, I strongly suspect this trade war within China is, is going to prop I, I don't really know obviously it's a very complicated issue but it's probably going to adversely affect us uh, ultimately and uh, having like a currency that wasn't as coupled to the international trade might have prevented some of that I think it's hard to say yeah one of the arguments that I've used throughout the podcast is that in this western world nobody really gets out of bed in the morning and says I need sound money in my life yeah. I don't like inflationary U.S. dollars. I don't like what they give me and the kind of purchasing power that I have when I hold them. And I want something which is going to gain value in time. I mean, you have so many options from investing in S&P 500 to gold and stuff like that. But the people who need Bitcoin the most in the world are actually those who cannot afford it and have no means to access it. And I guess it can be a great way to leverage against the oppressive governments of the world. And we see it happen right now in Venezuela and maybe to a smaller extent in Palestine, which is a state that is not officially recognized by the international community. And I think we also had some cases in North Korea, which is, uh, in the middle of a huge embargo in terms of trade, and there is no way for them to acquire external capital. So they were said to be running mining rigs for Bitcoin, which I guess is a creative solution to a problem which they are having. Yeah. It also blows my mind when I think about it, that Bitcoin is an American invention at core. You have had decades of scientific researches in computer science and cryptography, which were all American from Rolf Merkel. I think also Nick Sabo and Hal Finney and Tim May and all the cypherpunks and their mailing list and their meetings, they were all American. And Satoshi Nakamoto, it doesn't matter where he or she or it comes from, the references that are on in the white paper are American in themselves. If you look at them, all the inspiration that Satoshi has taken is pretty much American. And this invention, which I have defined previously as being American, works against the agenda of the United States in terms of foreign policy. As you have governments which use Bitcoin as a way of getting away from US dollar. And it's interesting to me. And to all these people who claim that it's an invention by the CIA or some kind of governmental experiment, well, it, it has gone wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I know. I think I agree with that. Um, 
I will say, I, I think that uh, one of the failings of Bitcoin has probably been its mining infrastructure. It, it, it should, it seems to me, it should be the case that if mining's working well, um, you should be able to always buy Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, this is like a, a heretical opinion, I think, these days. But it used to be that one of the primary functions of mining was to uh, offer Bitcoin users the ability to purchase Bitcoin from their electric company. And in the old days, uh, the guys that were around knew that, I think, because we didn't have exchanges. So we needed to buy Bitcoin either through um, chat channels from people, but primarily really people who, uh, who bought it from their electric company. And uh, we've just lost sight of that, I think, uh, unfortunately, in the Bitcoin community. Yeah, I agree to some extent. I, I think even Satoshi, if you read the forum posts on Bitcoin Talk, he wasn't expecting for mining to become something industrial where people create pools and then put together their A6 in a facility and run Bitcoin like that. I think his vision was for everybody to have a mining rig, rig in their homes. And I'm not sure, maybe my memory has faded or something, but I think at some point he suggested that it can be used as a heating machine when you're running your computer with Bitcoin and you're mining, you can actually heat your home. Yeah. I mean, another, another problem I think we have that's related to some of this is the, uh, the problems that happen with miner centralization, principally that you, you end up needing a permit to, to mine. So I would argue that now you can't mine without a government permit or without a friend who has a government permit that allows you to mine. So that, that's been kind of uh, bothersome to me. But it's also true that Bitcoin's outgrown a lot of the uh, earliest needs. It seems like most of the people who buy Bitcoin now, uh, like you said, are the, either American or are at least uh, first world-ish enough to not need Bitcoin so much as they wish to speculate on Bitcoin. And it may just be that that's what Bitcoin is now. So if that's true, it may end up be we don't even need mining at all, frankly. You could just replace mining with like a developer-signed system or something. Uh, but yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know enough about you. I, I, you know, I, I, we could take the discussion a few different places. Um, it seems to me that Bitcoiners are very much, uh, like chained to the incumbent state of things rather than, uh, finding themselves with the ability to like imagine what the ideal world would look like, which has been kind of a big part of my platform. Right. You said Bitcoiners are, as in you distinguish yourself from the crowd and you don't consider yourself to be a Bitcoiner, which is strange because you hold one Bitcoin, right? And you're um, much more informed than the average Bitcoiner. So, so a thing that I, I generally try to, so yeah, for me, I generally try not to have an anthropocentric view of the universe, which is kind of a weird thing for anybody to have. So like, there's a, that's a huge discussion. I, I don't want to waste everyone's time, but like the gist is that I try to strive to not see things as one of the group or one of the in-kind group, or even as a human, frankly. I would strive to see things as they are, independent of the human frame. Um, but what you would reference in terms of like who, who we are and who they are, that, that kind of fits into that model. Um, it, it's also what politics is, is, is a science, is you know, the science of we and they. And to talk about them in a frame that is not ours is to talk about them in generally uh, like an amoral sense. So in the same way that we might talk about cats without having any allegiance to the uh, true cat or the pure cat or the uh, holy cat or whatnot, like that is how I would generally strive to talk about any group of humans, which I guess is weird. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of tribalism in this space and people like to identify themselves as being something or if they like somebody, they're going to embrace a label, which I guess is dangerous just because we, in this mindset, we are blocked from thinking objectively. And it's good and bad, you know? It, it, in, in balance, it's great. Maybe taken too far, it's bad. It's an identity group. Like, you are a Bitcoiner. Like, that is, you are of the Bitcoin. It's not any different than being of the Apache or of the Cherokee uh, or of, you know, the, the Beaver or of the America. Uh, it is your kind. 
Yeah, sure. But Bitcoin are just refers to using Bitcoin. You have well, it depends on who you're talking to, I think. Some of them call themselves maximalists. Others call the maximalists as being extremists or toxic maximalists or maximalist minimalists, if that makes sense. Yeah, it actually does make sense. That's not so bad. I don't know. You, these people are like striving to belong to a community when they do that. So to me, it has less to do with what their ideology is and more to do with the people they want to surround themselves with. So if someone says they want to be, or they are a maximalist, that tells me they want to be with people who are easily disgusted. That seems to be what that communicates. I don't know. Well, when I think of Bitcoin, it's a very complex invention, which is very hard to describe even in plain language. And if you ask 10 people who are very knowledgeable to define Bitcoin, they're going to use different terms and different approaches to it. It's also part of the decentralized culture that you don't have an official narrative. If you ask somebody, what is Ethereum? They're going to say, oh, it's this world computer or smart contracts platform. And when you say that, nobody is going to disagree from their community. But in the case of Bitcoin, you can say, you know, it's a great way to exchange value over the borders without being censored. And then you're going to have people who tell you, you know, that's a slippery slope because it's not that great mean of exchange anymore. And people are going to get the wrong impression. So it's better to present it as digital gold or something. And we have all these arguments which try to shape a narrative. But at the end of the day, it's decentralized, which means that anyone can see anything in it according to their needs and according to their expectations and maybe according to their background and education. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm very skeptical of like this decentralization word at this point. I hate to, I hate to say it. Because uh, it wasn't always that case. Um, I think it's a fine word, but it, it's it's lost its meaning over time. It, it used to be a little bit more specific, you know. And I like I, I now like you you referenced. I think that like there is a interest in like not having an official voice or an official anything. But I, I would actually take umbrage with that um, it, for a few easy reasons. Like number one, uh, I don't I don't think it's possible to have an unofficial relationship with your blockchain. Uh, I think Satoshi made that clear even in some of his posts because like you have to ask yourself like, well, okay, if I want to be a Bitcoiner, what do I do? And then it becomes like this very like, how to put it, emotionally charged moment where like you have to like not tell people what the official Bitcoin is for reasons that are obtuse. And you have to like leave it in the hands of like the mystery. And, but what you know is that this person will converge on the same exact reference client that everybody else does, that is uh, the Bitcoin standard. And, and that's true for every project, I would say. And, and it used to be that like Satoshi and Gavin and the old devs were like very adamant that like there had to be an official client. And uh, I, I agree with them on that. So I, I don't, so decentralization is like a, a communal goal, but it's, it's like freedom. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know what freedom means. That's a, that's so like the, they have you have these like these like cultural shelling points I guess that expresses some injustice that people perceive and so they end up on the shelling point and that, and I agree that that's how we've ended up here I guess but I, I think extrapolating from that and suggesting that there's a greater meaning might not work we can get into that maybe yeah sure if there is any specific side of it that you want to describe well yeah so like. A thing is decentralized if, so like, I, I like the semiotics of this the problem. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Semiotics is the study of signs. Um, so there's a sign. Uh, let's say good is the sign. You put the sign good at the fork in the road on, this, on, the, on the fork that you want people to go. So there's a, there's, you go down a road, there's a fork, and they can go down the, the road that says good or the sign that says good is, or they can go to the sign that says bad. And you would imagine that most people will go to the side that is good. That's like the vast majority of people will. Um, and, then, and then that's kind of what happened with decentralization. It just became synonymous with good. And so then the question is, what does it mean then? And it, it may mean as little as good means. I mean, good seems to mean 
uh, to be repeated. I think that's what good means. And so I think that that's also what decentralization means. But if you ask for like any degree of nuance, people don't have it. They'll, 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 tell, they'll make things up on the spot, like retroactively. Like, like they don't, like what is decentralization? And they'll like pause for a second and then they'll think about it because they, they, they didn't really think about it before. And then they're like, well, I, I guess I have to make something up. And then they usually say not centralized or, or something like that or freedom or something. And it, it seems to me that really these, these, these words only have, you, know, you, you probably don't think about decentralization other than when you're communicating to a group and only when you're communicating a pattern to be followed. And that's, I think, what decentralization means. But people then try to like predict what will be uh, like useful. And I don't think that that's, there's any relevance anymore. I, I think that the, the word itself is just something that emerges as a, as a rally point where if you feel that there is an injustice from centralization, but I don't think that it is itself like prescriptive in any way of things that should be done. I think it just reflects resentment that people have towards oppression or um, centralization or things that are legitimate concerns, frankly, in society, but that don't, I don't think that it means anything going forward. I think it just means that like, okay, you broke away from that body. So now you're here. And, and now this word simply means good and nothing else. That's what I think happened there. Yeah, it's actually interesting as sometimes people say that decentralization is a buzzword. And I remember Jackson Palmer, who also created Dogecoin, used to run a website which was called arewedecentralizedyet.com. Right, I remember that. And he used different metrics to express and pretty much highlight how some projects which were claiming to be decentralized actually had more than 90% of the supply being owned by 10% wallets. And they had just a few nodes running the protocol and they were not able to be mined and they had a huge pre-mine. And these are all indicators that this idea of decentralization is just the hype word, just something to create buzz and maybe write nice articles in mainstream media which covers phenomena from crypto. Yeah. But Bitcoin usually is revered as the pinnacle of decentralization. And there is this kind of consensus which says no other protocol is as decentralized as Bitcoin. But it's also relative to your metrics as I remember at some point that news broke about Ethereum having many more independent nodes being run. And I also know that Monero is more decentralized in terms of mining, just because it cancels the activity of A6 every, I think every few months you have a hard fork which blocks A6 and makes them redundant in the process. Yeah, I mean, if 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 you can take like, like the, uh, the the anthropocentrism out for a second, I guess for lack of a better word, um, and you looked at Bitcoin, you'd see some very like hilariously inconsistent things. So like right, right off the bat, you'll find that in this quote unquote decentralized system, you have like ninety eight percent or more of the users running the same consensus code, if not ninety nine point nine 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 percent, and then and then within that code you'll find the producer of that code to be a group who's labeled itself the Bitcoin Center, which is hilarious uh, to me. And then, and then within that code base, you'll find like all of these really funny things that are just like antithetical to this, this thing that people are calling decentralization. So like the easy one right now is the DNS seed servers, which I find very funny. Um, the, the, the function of the DNS seed servers may very well be like kind of minimal, but, but the point's the same. You've got like... Um, I want to say, see, Bitcoin Wiki. The, the seed servers are like seed.petertod.com, seed.bluebat.com. Uh, and there's like five of them. And, and, and uh, they're just people who put themselves on the list. And like my easy question would be, okay, well, I want, I want to add my name to the DNS seed server's address. What is the process for that? Who do I go through? And then invariably it becomes like an embarrassment to anybody who I asked that question to. Um, but the obvious answer is you have to go through the committee and you have to get, you know, uh, approved and you have to... Uh, it, it, you have to sort of indoctrinate yourself to uh, these people where you've now uh, accrued some level of trust. And, and like the decentralization, like prescription breaks apart very fast. 
I agree that Bitcoin is probably the most decentralized, um, but I, I just don't know that that means anything other than the people who have the most uh, oppression from centralization have arrived there. That's, that seems to be what that means to me. I agree with you in the sense that you have a lot of power in the hands of developers and you have to trust in their benevolence. And you have people like Vladimir van der Lan, and I hope I pronounce his name correctly. And he's basically the curator of everything which has to do with updates of the Bitcoin core protocol. Yeah, I think it's great, by the way. Like, these are they've done a good job. And you have these developers, some of them are the most prolific. There's how do you pronounce his name? You will. W U I L L E. Wooly. 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 Yeah, Wooly. It's a it's a funny word. I yeah. think he has the most commitments. The last does. time I checked, he was very prolific. But there this is also a point which came to my mind, but it's centralized in this sense, and we have to trust their benevolence. And in this regard, it's more like a monarchy or something. I have yeah. a background in political science, and I know the classification of political regimes. And in the case of Bitcoin, it's not really, no, it's not monarchy. It's more like aristocracy in the old sense. It's not oligarchy because it's not the richest who hold power and have the final word in this. It's actually the elites who actually understand how it works and have a technical perspective on Bitcoin. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think that's perfectly reasonable. They are the ones who make the project flourish or fall. And I remember there was that inflation bug, which they discovered and was not exploited, thankfully. But it, it's up to them to prevent these situations from ever happening. And the idea which came to my mind, wait, I, I think I forgot it. It will come to me. Okay. I was speaking of political regimes. I, I will say, though, you should consider um, one of the issues that uh, we're not allowed to talk about is what happens when there are major contentions in the aristocracy, uh, which has to happen eventually. So, like, let's say uh, Peter Woolley goes left and the rest of the aristocracy goes right. Then my question to you is, which is the true Bitcoin? Yeah. That has to happen at some point. That has to because people don't live forever. But they also phased out Gavin. Oh, agreed. And, and uh, you know, there's like legendary ramifications from that. Uh, you know, we, we had a, a giant community split. And, uh, you know, that's great. Uh, we, we've seemingly uh, moved past most of that, although it should be said we lost a lot of our, our, our headway as a result. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, maybe the next time we'll have no friction, or maybe the next time will be the last time Bitcoin is left standing as, as one unit, you know? That's, these, are, these, are pro these are problems that should be proactively addressed, if you ask me, but nobody else thinks that. So I guess we just, just uh, kind of hold trust that they'll get it resolved, I guess. I think it's a Zeus problem. You have the Greek mythology where you had Zeus and Hades and Poseidon who took over the kingdom of their parents and they overthrew their father and killed him and then they split the power between themselves. It's the kind of scenario where they build or they, they take over the world and they build the world according to their views and they don't really like when we talk about what used to be before that. Yeah, I'll go for that. That's actually, I mean, that's a little, a little bit dramatic, but it's not wrong. Uh, okay, maybe it's not the best comparison. But what I wanted to say and I forgot was that when you look at the GitHub repository for Bitcoin and you notice all these developers who have made a lot of commitments, you realize that the most vocal of them and the ones who give interviews and the ones who go to conferences tend to be the ones who have made the least contributions. So the more proactive the developers are, 
the harder it is to contact them and the less likely they are to give interviews, which I find interesting. Yeah, I mean, you've got a couple things going on there. Like, I, I generally make the point that there are carbon programmers and there are silicon programmers. And uh, people don't like that, but it's just obvious to me that some people have to program the computers and some people have to program the humans. And you only have so many hours in a day and the specialization required in each of those fields is very different. Uh, I think that the people who program humans are probably the more valuable parts of the system. But I, I agree that you know the, the code commits are also uh, cherished and valuable as well. But it, it is a bit perverse in the case of Bitcoin because many of the people in Bitcoin believe that uh, people who control the money unsound it. So you, you can make the case, I think, uh, very reasonably that most Bitcoiners resent the people who code, even if they, they don't actively, they, they're of a delusion that doesn't let them see that the code is being written. It's very strange, but uh, we can get into that maybe, but um, it, it might be the case that the people who work on the code are actually unsounding the money and thus are, are not contributing. And that the people who are programming the humans are actually the ones who are writing the best code. Now, I don't know if that's what I believe, but it's a, it's a case that can be made. Uh, I guess that's the conservative worldview, which is getting promoted by what you said, people who program the people. Yeah. And it's also interesting as when you first get into Bitcoin, it's being presented to you as something which has existed for over 10 years and has been the same and has remained unchanged. Oh, it's a rock. That's what you're told first thing. This is digital gold. It's got 79 protons in its nucleus. And it is it is adorned to the heads of kings for, for eons. I mean, this is like the safety platform, which I, I find to be hilarious. We we can talk about the postmodernism, which you know, some people like roll their eyes at that, but like it's very pronounced here. And I always like well, look at safe and Dean, and I'm just like, okay, that guy is as postmodern as it gets. Uh, and maybe that's good, but you see this repeatedly, I think, here in ways that are kind of funny to me. I, I hope I get Saifuddin on the podcast, but I don't think he likes me. I disagreed with him on Twitter a few times. I'm happy he hasn't blocked me, which means that maybe I presented something which gets a pass. <laughs> well, he's going to end up creating an orthodox. I mean, he already has created an orthodoxy. Like, it, it turns into, like, a, an Amish community after some point. And, like, even unironically, he's doing this, like, meat-eating thing that just contributes to the, the level of uh, like extremism, I think, in his platform. And it's a shame because uh, he has a lot of value, and I don't, I don't mind him doing it. I think he needs to probably uh, cater to that demographic. Uh, but I, I think that the intolerance and the indignation that he encourages is harmful uh, to the community, so I, I, I would really ask him to just change that. However, it seems as if he, he has this... Uh, this trigger finger, uh, and it's understandable. He has to block people because if the social distance were to get too close, uh, he would be uh, found to be a fraud and he would lose his power. So it, like, he has to do that. He can't, any, anything that's a deviant opinion can't enter his social sphere because it will depower him. It's also interesting to me that people like him are trying to turn being a Bitcoiner into a lifestyle. Oh, yeah. I, I once posted something which basically said that I believe in Bitcoin. I want it to succeed, but at the same time, I'm a vegetarian, which means that I can never sit at the same table with other people who are what they call themselves to be carnivores and they only eat meat. And I actually got a response from Seifuddin, and he said, All your Bitcoins are going to be confiscated. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, like the the sort of, I mean, there's an illiteracy that's endemic to the space, particularly in relation to like how people are programmed. And uh, it hurts us, I think. Um, you know, I, if I can shamelessly plug uh, the Church of Monero, uh, I, I really like what's happened there thus far. Uh, it, may, it may be that the Church of Monero fails, but uh, I think the truth is you cannot have a faith in any money without a community. That seems kind of obvious. Uh, so I, I think that the... The, the, the process that he's undertaking is understandable uh, and it's rooted in uh, perhaps a, a noble end 
but also a, a, a required end. Uh, but because he doesn't seem to um, embrace the, the academics, he's choosing the craziest end. So like in the Church of Monero, uh, I don't speak for the church. I don't, you know, this is, but this is a very loose movement. But it seems as if thus far, one of the, the main tenets of the church has been to not get involved in any excess ideology at all. Because as soon as you declare like a meat-eating position, then you alienate the vegetarian. So like why, what value does it offer then? And the value it offers sometimes is that like you get to capture um, a, a certain type of uh, person, but I, I don't know that that's always the kind of person you want to capture in your community. And we'll see who ends up in safety in circles at the end of all of this. But uh, in the church, we, we haven't really taken any uh, stances on almost anything, honestly, other than uh, you know, the tenets of Monero, uh, anonymous money. But there's also the argument, which is very valid, that it doesn't matter what you eat. It doesn't matter what you profess. The protocol is agnostic and doesn't care. So as long as you like it, then you might have this kind of quality which makes you eligible to be a member of the community. But at the same time, they're trying to establish an ideology which cherishes some values to which you have to abide or else you become a weirdo or somebody who should join the Ethereum community because right now they are doing this um, dichotomy where you have these very manly people who are pro-guns and wear MAGA hats and wear beards and they eat meat and they're Bitcoiners. And then you have the Ethereum people or the ETARDS, ETH ARDS, who are vegans and they look like Vitalik and they're skinny and they think about social justice and they, they tend to be much more leftist with their political ideas. But I think that's dumb and it creates just some kind of stereotype and models which make communities become more labelable. Is that a word when you can- Yeah, probably... essentializable, it's probably the better word. Uh, yeah. When, when no one's official, everyone's official. It's just something that's been very perverse to me. Meaning like, if you think of what the SJW is, like right now, anybody listening to this, in your head, I just said the SJW. So now the, the SJW object was communicated by me to you. And you have in your head a picture of the SJW. And my bet is your picture is this uh, intolerant woman, this indignant young woman with purple hair, maybe armpit hair, uh, who has like an I hate men shirt on. And it's sad because that's not actually the essential form of the SJW. There probably really isn't any essential form of the SJW, really, but maybe it's like a young person. Um, but, it, but it's because like everybody, when there's no official person for that object, then everybody is. And then it seems like the intolerance get heard the most nowadays. And so, uh, yeah, so when you think of a Bitcoiner now, it's, it, the, the social media companies are going to uh, algorithmatize a extreme form for their business model. And it, it's probably going to be safe indeed. Like he, he, he kind of accidentally stumbled on that. It's, you know, so, it's, so it's because he's extreme that he will get to be the official image of Bitcoin probably, I would suggest. I don't know, he, he is followed and accompanied during conferences by some bigger figures. I think Jimmy Song is more influential, but he hasn't written a book. So I guess well, aren't that... they all eating, are they all proud of steak eaters who probably hate canes and, uh, so, and they have very similar views is my suspicion? I, I think Jimmy Song is more humane and nicer. And I, I had an interview with him and I told this joke that, you know, when we lured him into the interview on Twitter, my boss basically said, hey, Jimmy, I have some steak recipes for you. And if you do this interview, I'm going to send them to you. And I, I told him, you know, my boss lured you into this interview by mentioning a steak, but actually you ended up having the interview with a vegetarian. And he told me, oh, I, I have been a vegetarian for 20 years. And I was surprised. <clears throat> And he wasn't yeah, judgmental. Too. He said, oh, you just do what you believe in. I don't care. Well, that's good. That's very good to hear. That's productive. 
But Seyfedin, he seems more strict and more stubborn. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, he's, a, he's like a holy roller, you know, he's like, a, like the preacher type. It's just that simple. I, I very much think of like the sort of, they were not around anymore, and it was kind of an American thing. Like in the 80s, Reagan years, we had like this stereotype, uh, the Christian preacher person who was on television who, who would damn the infidels and things like that. And uh, his sort of posture and platform reminds me very much of that. And that's okay. I, I, don't, I don't even begrudge that. I think it's great. Like, we should totally have that. Um, it, it, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a little bit perverse that, uh, that, that he preaches uh, a form of intolerance uh, against others of, of the same kind. That, that I think, is, is not productive. Uh, but other than that, I think it's fine. Um, you know, we'll see what ends up happening. But he'll fall from grace, I think, as people start to realize that there's a lot of holes in his, his arguments at this point, uh, for which he, he has to resort to blocking. And that's sad, because what will end up happening is we'll end up losing him, who, who really was an asset, uh, but because, I guess, of it's just the nature of things, he, he's going to end up probably burning his platform, I guess. We'll see. You never know, you know? I was just thinking right now, having a debate in my head, whether or not this is just pure gossip. But it, it makes sense as the point of this podcast is to discuss the politics of Bitcoin, and this is the inner politics of Bitcoin, as in we talk about the major figures which shape the narratives and introduce to newbies what Bitcoin is about. I guess five years ago, it was about Gavin and maybe Garzik and some other people who are influential and had a word to say and people were following them. And now that we've had this revolution where big blockers were separated from those who believe in scalability through a second layer, then we are having this rise of new figures. And it's interesting. You have people like Giacomo Zucco, who is maybe the most prominent European Bitcoiner. And then you have Jimmy Song and you have Jameson Lop. Uh, I guess Lop is my favorite of the bunch. Yeah, he's a solid guy, actually. I'd probably say the same. I really like him. And uh, I also had the privilege to interview him. And he seemed to know a lot. And he spoke like a lawyer, actually, which I didn't expect. He had this very developed vocabulary. So I guess if he were to do writing and become a journalist, he would do a better job than I do. As if you talk to him, you can tell that the ideas in his mind are very logical. He doesn't err much. He doesn't talk in ums. When you, you ask him something and he automatically systemizes the answer, and comes up with something which is logical and to the point, but also wrapped in a package that makes it sugar-coated and nice so you can digest it. <laughs> yeah, he's a smart guy. Yeah, I like Lop. I, I, think he's, I think he's a solid character as well, actually. I don't think I've ever had a bad interaction with him, which is tough to say because I've had a lot of bad interactions with a lot of people. <laughs> but on Twitter, I, I think he is being overly optimistic. But I guess that's his public persona. You got to present confidence here. Like that's what people. That's that's the reason why these people get selected. You're not. If you don't present confidence, you're not. Like the Safe has got some like stupid, stupid ideas. But he's very, very confident, so it attracts people who need that. And uh, that's generally the number one thing that people look for in in a thought leader in this space is confidence. Because like like the truth is that ninety like ninety nine percent of the people will never understand anything that gets done in blockchain. Uh, it's incomprehensible in most in most ways, uh, and so the the only thing they can go by, I guess, is is some some degree of character, uh, which is sad. Uh, frankly, I don't I don't like that, but I, I understand it, and I guess the character they look for is confidence, which it's it's it's, it's probably better than most. It's it's a bit it's a bit maligned, um, ultimately, um, but yeah. It's that, that's why these people, these, the, the, in a lot of ways, the Maxwellists have presented disgust, and, and it's this form of snobbery, really, with people who have uh, what could be a risky opinion. And so it's, it's, it's in that presentation of confidence 
such that like I am I am better because I I don't possess uh the, you know the uh the, the risk comprehension that I think has attracted people to these platforms. So with Lop, when he says things that are you know like you know having guns out and being a big man, that's what that's what he's doing. Whether he knows it or not, I don't know. But he's presenting the confidence that would exude and produce more following. Which is a tip to you as well, if you want to, if you also want to receive that end of respect, I suppose, you have that option. Yeah, I don't know if I want that. My, my point is not to become popular or to sell anything. I'm not selling any ideas. I'm just doing a service which people don't even appreciate, and sometimes tell me I should learn to code. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, Sorry, I need to cut you off. I, I just, I can, I can, I can, I can totally relate to that. I'll just see how it goes and see for how long I can actually make a living out of this. <laughs> it's a hard, it's a hard way to make a living. It really is. So, like, you don't have recurring capital coming into the space generally. So, like that, that makes it hard. That makes it real hard. Um, you know, some people are making money in the space, and that's good. I, I try to tell people, I have this conversation all the time. People, want, people love this space. They love it. And that's awesome. It's so encouraging. And I, I love it too. But uh, like many things that we love, it is hard to make it profitable. So in the same way that we love maybe, you know, music uh, and these types of things, uh, you can see those problems here. So it, it, like the, the most profitable way to be a Bitcoiner is to have a normal job and to take money from your normal job and invest in Bitcoin and not spend one hour of your time thinking about Bitcoin. Uh, because that, that's, that's time you're not making Bitcoin money. Uh, but the, the sad part is that like now it's no more fun. It's not fun anymore. But you do that, it's like, what, like what, you know, what the hell? What, why are you even here now? So you got to balance it, I guess. I don't know. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could compromise and get a regular office job and then spend time reading stuff on crypto Twitter like some other people do. I, I don't really it. have that sellout mentality. Uh, what, what I do, I like to do it right or righteously. I don't know how I should define it. I mean, uh, uh, but first I have to feel all right with myself and not have that feeling of guilt that I tricked somebody into paying me for something which I didn't do right. Yeah. So if I'm fine with I'm with what I'm doing, then I guess I don't care much about other people's appreciation. As I know that 99% of the people I, I interact with, and this is not snobbery, but I'm aware that I, I got the kind of education in political science and diplomacy and philosophy and ethics. A lot of people don't consider this, and that's fine. I'm not going to judge them. I, I will say Bitcoin does eat its own. That, that is one very disappointing fact of the space that has uh, really uh, impacted me in many ways. So that's been manifested in so many forms. Very few people, there's no rank of any kind, and, and there should be. And there's no, social capital is fleeting. So you, you have these like disgrace exits left and right. You know, Roger Veer maybe being most famous at the moment. Um, but you have, every, you know, everyone from like Gavin uh, all the way up to Jeff, Garzik, and uh, Hearn, and then like a, a bajillion people in between, honestly. James D'Angelo, Angelo, I want to say. Um, it, it's, it, it, I, I think I've survived the degree that I have through, I don't know, tenacity or something. But if you break ranks with the herd, the herd can be punishing here in a way that is not evident in, in many other spaces. And uh, I would tell you to, to be aware of that because um, a lot of people really hear, like, like you think Giacomo, like I don't, he hasn't like, he hasn't really reasoned his way to a lot of his beliefs. A lot of the beliefs are just unreasonable anyways. And so if you find a way to reason that doesn't like comport with something, his incentive is to kick you out. It isn't to understand you. It's to be disgusted. Um, and I don't even, that's not even true to Giacomo. I shouldn't really pick on Giacomo specifically because he's a nice guy, but um, that's often the case in the space. You'll see that over and over and over again. And um, you have these people that, you know, like Jeff Garzik, let's say, who put in like tons of great code, did some great things, who needed money maybe, or who knows what this, he had a kid or something. Who the hell knows what the story is? 
Um, but because he broke ranks, then he now gets he gets negative respect. It's not it's not even zero. It's like he becomes an enemy, um, and that, and and that that is a discouraging thing. You see it all the time here. Uh, so I don't know that that we that we really could use a lot of work on, frankly. And uh, I, I hope the community wisens up on that. We'll see if they do. But I guess this is a reflection of our society at large, as we have seen in the last decade, these movements of shaming and punishing people for one bad deed without considering the sum of their actions. Yeah, I agree. If you are a very respected, reputable person and you do something wrong, it's going to follow you. Even nowadays with the the internet age when no one... The internet doesn't forget. So if it's posted there, it's going to follow you for the rest of your days. You have to deal with it and find reasonable people who are not reasonable all the time. And there's also the argument that not necessarily everything that is written on the internet is true. So you can have people who try to purposely take you down and damage your reputation. And not everybody can afford to have a publicist like the celebrities do. So it's difficult. We have seen with, I'm not sure if it's the best example, but the Me Too movement has made a lot of people look terrible and even disappear from the public eye for a while. Even though maybe that they were great people, they have enriched our culture in ways that Many people will, will never do it in their lifetime. But we have taken them down for this criterion, which I guess is relevant in a context, but it should not affect their profession. If I'm a great baker, but I'm a piece of shit, and I, I treat other people poorly, I shouldn't lose my job if I make great bread. If that bread benefits the society at large, and when I'm all alone, I bake it, then I should be left alone to do my job and maybe get shit from people when I'm not doing my job, because that's when I deserve it. I, I agree with that 100%. I mean, it's very well said. Now, unfortunately, uh, that isn't... You, you, you have this... Pro- I mean, the social media companies really do make this problem worse than it would otherwise be, and I don't, I don't even blame them, because, like, they they have an investor responsibility. They have to do this. Um, but yeah, you're you're right. I mean, my, my solution, which I think has worked just great for me, but I, I can see why it doesn't work for anybody else. But my solution has been to roll with the punches. Uh, there's there's so much incentive out there to say outlandish things, and there's the zero incentive to correct the record. So uh, you'll if you do searches for me, you'll find just the craziest things that I have nothing to do with that I find funny at this point. You know, everything from you know my history. Uh, raping women and my registered sex offender status and my my bigotry and th- these things like whatever the boogeyman of the day is you can you be rest assured that Chris Rose has been called it so I just I just tell people that I'm these things and then uh, as a result uh, seemingly everybody understands that uh, the internet is absurd and that Chris probably isn't these things um, you know and unfortunately there's side effects to that and it takes and it also takes a lot of like the gumption to just say like yeah I'm a rapist deal with it. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it does, it actually does work. And I, I'd like to think that society will move on to a point now where like, they'll just be like, oh, well, in the internet, there's, you know, craziness and there's there probably isn't actually anything true uh, about what, you know, the, the uh, gossip rumor mill says on there. But we'll see what ends up happening. Yeah, you, you just make me look up your name, but there is an activist for animal rights. Yeah. Who is more prominent. <laughs> yes, a different Chris Therese. So that's not the first result which I get. Uh, I found some podcast interviews, but anyway, I shouldn't be doing this on the job to call it so. It's okay. We should be talking about Bitcoin, and I guess we can agree that we need some kind of... I guess there is an immune system which takes away the bad actors, but we should also see the benefit of bacteria yeah, I agree. The, the, the immune system for bad actors isn't really, if you ask me, it doesn't really work that well, honestly. Um, it, it just doesn't seem to. Uh, 
we we, we have bad actors. I mean, the, the ICO thing was like really embarrassing. I think for us, frankly, it, it, the, what percentage of the ICOs were were like anything other than like rotes rotes scams? It, like very close to zero. Maybe Ethereum is an exception. Maybe. Um, and like the immune system that we have, I, I, it pales in comparison to more like mainline systems. Uh, it, it could be much better, uh, but there isn't an incentive, I guess, to do that, or nobody seems to care, or nobody believes otherwise. I don't, I don't know what it is. Uh, so it, it exists in some form. I mean, the other one too is like, how, like how many forks do we have for Bitcoin now? Like, it, we sh if if we were if our immune system were working well, there would have just been one Bitcoin, but now we have multiple Bitcoins and uh, no end in sight to that. So I don't know that we've actually done a great job of that. Yeah, you spoke about ICOs, and I think MasterCoin was the first ICO, and it used Bitcoin. And until Ethereum came around, every ICO was based on Bitcoin. And even before this craze and this huge wave of wild ideas, which were somehow getting funded by people who probably got their Ethereum tokens at $5 and we're trying to get rid of them at 500 to see if they can maximize their investment. We, we have had, even before this wave, something which was using Bitcoin and was doing it in a time when the community was smaller. And even in these cases, we, I don't think we got anything of value out of it or any project which survived and managed to deliver something to us. Yeah. I mean, the, the craziness of the, they're really, these are like tokens, these are tokens of injustice is generally what I've seen happen. Meaning there's an injustice that people feel and then you offer them shares in that injustice. And almost every ICO took this formula. So you, you have everything from like, um, you know, the, I guess the, the factum-esque uh, evils of uh, data manipulators, I guess. And so like that's the injustice. And so you buy a factum token and now you have a checksum uh, that will be like this justice that, that your data gets. Um, and you've seen that with like uh, Ethereum uh, as well in, in multiple forms of Ethereum. I think with Ethereum, it was like very pronounced in the sense that like crowdfunding was a market that was now open to people. And I guess like the SEC was like performing the injustice. And so now uh, you can you can fund these projects. But also with Ethereum, to its credit, it, it kind of like, I guess, had the injustice of, of like the Amazon centralization computer that would be like replaced by like the, the justice world computer that was Ethereum. Um, Bitcoiners on, on average are like, the, are, are the like epitome of the social justice war. It's just that it's, it's like a very like finance oriented uh, injustice community, I guess. It's very strange. I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen anything like this before um, or anybody has, but it, it's almost like, uh, I guess, in this sort of like virtue signaling era that we have, where nobody is really held accountable for the work they do. They're only uh, appreciated for the, the signal that they present. It seems like the consequence of that market was that you would uh, accrue investment by, uh, by combating the greater injustice. So like, whereas in traditional markets, you would provide an efficiency to like suppliers or, or customers or something where it like reduce the friction in their life. Here in blockchain, it was instead a matter of finding the greatest injustice and then issuing shares in that injustice as, a, as like a cultural shelling point, I guess, for people to do something. But since there's never, it's, this is all virtue signaling, there's never any action. It, it just, that's where it usually dies. That's, that's how I would describe what I've seen here. Yeah, and I guess you have been around for a longer time than most people. And have you remained active all throughout the years? Was it like? Oh yeah, I'm always doing stuff in this space. Always, I, the amount of if, if you, the amount of time I've spent. If it, I I love what I do. I love working with people, especially. But uh, the amount of time that I've spent, like if you look at it, if, I don't know. I don't know that it's like the best job, really. Like I've I've enjoyed it. It has been fun, and I would not to do it over again. I would not change change many things. But uh, in many ways, like it's not very well compensated at all. Um, but I'm always, I'm always doing stuff that I enjoy behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. I've been stepping back more lately. I mean, even recently, I, I, I announced that I'm putting the show aside for an indefinite period um, for, for a bunch of reasons, you know. 
I, I think I really do think that the social media companies are probably very harmful to our community's development, and I haven't decided what to do about that. So I've got ideas, but uh, I, I'm still kind of trying to figure them out. Do any of these ideas involve Bitcoin? Not really. I, I don't. A Bitcoin. The problem with Bitcoin, if it, 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 it is immoral to do anything, like that is just the case. So even even if you want to fix the like the, the community problem, so like like I don't know, like this. I mean, Bitcoin had this huge cultural appropriation issue uh, over the over the word Bitcoin, uh, which I found very embarrassing from start to finish. But that, that's another point. So like a, a guy showed up and said that he was the true Bitcoin, and then people went ballistic. Um, and, and so, like, you saw this gigantic problem. Every, everybody had this gigantic problem, which was that the cultural product that is Bitcoin has been appropriated and is being used in a community in a way that is not comporting with the, uh, the faith of, of the true Bitcoiner, I guess, is one way of describing it. And uh, so, like, the obvious solution is to just protect the brand, which is, you know, it's, it's, such a, it's one of the old, you're, you're in political science, like, you know how this works. Like there's there's all kinds of literature on how you protect the brand, um, and if but the problem is that in order to protect the brand, you you have to take an act of leadership, um, and you have to make a change, both of which are immoral. So in Bitcoin, there's no incentive for you to solve the problems that everybody has for those reasons. So unfortunately, I don't I don't see that as, as something that's going to change anytime soon, and uh, so like I've been focusing these efforts in Monero for that reason. Uh, which, you know, it's kind of sad, frankly, because I, I would have liked to have seen that uh, that efficiency applied here in Bitcoin. But the, the incentives are not allowing that. Mm, that's an interesting perspective. Uh, I thought you were more into Monero due to the privacy and maybe some fungibility advantages that it has. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I mean, Monero just kind of is Bitcoin, honestly. Like, like if, you, if you asked yourself, if you, if you could... If you said, like, okay, ideally, would Bitcoin do this? Okay. The, the, you're probably going to end up pretty close to Monero if you, if you start sniffing around. So, like, uh, maybe I'm wrong, you know, obviously. Um, but things like, you know, would it be fungible? Ideally, Bitcoin would be fungible. Maybe. You know, like, that's a nuanced discussion. But, like, for most people, that's what they would probably say. Um, and then uh, you might say, like, okay, well, ideally, would we have, like, how, what kind of mining would we use? And then ideally... You know, how would the development team, like you end up getting to Monero pretty quickly. So like at the end of the day, like the, the value proposition of Bitcoin is, is not in the code in my estimation, it's in the brand. And in, in many ways, Bitcoin may just be the first mover coin. Like that just might be what the proposition is. And maybe, and maybe that's the only thing that matters. Maybe that's like, that's, that's the most important thing for a blockchain is to be the first mover. But um, really other than that, I, I think the technicals don't really change that much between these systems. I mean, a Litecoin is identical almost to, to Bitcoin. So in, in many senses, you know the technicals don't really matter for that reason alone, because how else would you, if the technicals are the same in Litecoin and Bitcoin, how do you explain the price delta? And then the answer is very obvious. It's like, oh, okay, well, there's more faith in this brand. And then, and then you can drill down into why that is. And most of that is probably the first mover. Uh, that's an interesting argument. Well, it goes back to the idea of setting a standard, and I, I don't want to reference a book by Seyfried Dean, which is called The Bitcoin Standard. <laughs> you can. I have that book. <laughs> he autographed it for me, even. But uh, I guess it happens everywhere. Even, uh, I think I read somewhere that somebody invented more efficient types of keyboards so you can write words in English in a more efficient way. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't Dvorak. out of convenience. I typed Dvorak actually, so yeah. You have in every sector, in every field that you can research on, you can find something that improves upon the standard. But people say, why change something which works? And at the end of the day, I, I think Bitcoin works very well. And it also fulfills that criterion of immaculate conception, which no other coin has. Maybe Grin has it nowadays to some extent. Well, that could be a bug, though. Like, I don't know that, that, I, don't know that I accept that that has to be a feature. Like, I could just as easily make the case why that would be uh, detrimental. 
It depends on your goals. If you want the technology to be as advanced as possible, then it's better to have a degree of centralization and a strong leader who leads the direction, maybe. I would argue that the valuing the immaculate form is probably a, a testament to the efficacy of the, of the carbon programmers. So, so the people who are working on programming the humans would program the humans to hold that value. But I would allege that that value would not have existed otherwise, because I don't think anybody showed up to, to say they wanted that. They were programmed to believe that they wanted that. So when you, when you suggest that you want an immaculate Bitcoin, um, my suspicion is that you would want to belong to a greater herd and that you, you must hold that value in order to be uh, held in good esteem by that herd, which you, know, you, you may or may not agree with or even know, but that would be how I would probably perceive that. Well, I don't think that this social component is the most important. I think in the case of Bitcoin, it's a value proposition and the supply and all the economics that you know how often blocks are supposed to be generated and how many coins are supposed to be minted as reward for the miners. And you don't want this system to be disrupted. I think that's the whole point. Uh, well, I would... The supply is probably contingent on the community faith. So, like, you should consider that, like, if in, in, I think the earlier scenario where, like, where let's say the lead dev went left, everyone else went right, the coin supply would double. So, that, so I would I would actually suggest that that supply is itself determined by the community, and you know that's arguable, but it is. Yeah, we, if they arbitrarily decided for a large majority to modify what kind of what version of the software their nodes are running and decide by consensus that maybe it's better to have 42 million and double the supply and even promise that they're going to have the coins airdropped to them for every Bitcoin that they hold, they're going to get another one. I guess a lot of people would say, oh, that's brilliant, free money, I want it. Yeah, well, I mean, the other thing you can do, you can take a different, like everybody in, in Bitcoin takes this, this immaculate view such that like the incumbent form is the ideal form. Um, I, I characterize that as a form of slavery, quite frankly, um, which is highly pejorative. I get that. But um, it, it is kind of consistent in many ways, I think, because like it, it means you are not permitted to imagine a better world. Um, but that's, that's kind of a bit of a tangent. In, in any case, like you, it would seem to me like okay, if you imagined in the ideal, in the in the ideal deployment of Bitcoin, like what would it look like? And like for me, I might say something like, oh well, they'd be using it in Venezuela. They'd have like a healthy economy, marketing it, and, and a few things like that. And then you're going to end up at Dash having manifested that ideal. And uh, I, I don't really, I have a complicated relationship with Dash. I don't own any Dash. I don't promote Dash. But um, I can't help but to recognize that they've achieved in, the, in these ways. And so like the notion, they, they have achieved in this, these ways because they haven't embraced the immaculate form as their notion of the ideal. They instead said, well, we, we would, our ideal would be a vendor uptake. And so it could end up being, and I wouldn't be surprised at all, if, frankly, if this happened. In 50 years or maybe less, it turns out that like the, the, the model of development that Bitcoin has undertaken can no longer really support itself. So what ends up happening maybe is like, it, it no longer gets updated very much. And so it start, starts to fall into disarray. And then the community realizing this says, well, shoot, we got to get some people in here to fix this. How do we do that? And then the obvious answer is, oh, well, we have to have a tax. Uh, and, and then you, and that's what Dash did, frankly. And that's what like Decred does. And uh, I don't know that, that, I believe that that's the ideal, but it's at least conceivable that that, that would be better. And we don't know that. Like, like, it, like you, you may say that you know that, but I don't believe anybody does. I think that's, that's a market decision. So like, this is one of the reasons why I like indexing as a strategy is that I don't have to worry about what happens in that case. I just, you know, I would have like the top 10, the top 10 cryptos and like, okay, if one of them takes off, then great. Like that, that's fine by me. We discussed about an hour ago before we started recording this podcast. And you told me that you know ways in which Bitcoin can go away tomorrow and fail yeah. as a project. Oh, yeah. And I guess in this regard, I'm 
much less knowledgeable and much more brainwashed as I believe that out of all the cryptocurrency projects that we have right now, it's most likely to be around in 5, 10, 20 years. Right. So, I mean, okay, there's a couple of scenarios. Um, I don't actually think technical scenarios would, would affect Bitcoin at all. I think that all, for all of the discussion about the immaculate form, as soon as there's any level of pain, Bitcoiners will immediately change their mind on that. Uh, which we saw like with, with the DAO and Ethereum, and which we've also seen in Bitcoin too, by the way. Bitcoin's had its own DAO moments multiple times. There's been three hard forks. Uh, we can get into that maybe if you want. But there's been a number of times when code is law uh, was, was not actually uh, chosen despite being a, a professed community value. So I don't think the technicals would actually uh, kill Bitcoin. And, all, and the newest CVE also, frankly, is, is highly damning to that, that goal. Because the newest CVE, uh, that's another thing we go into, but that was like, like a fairly damning mistake. Um, it lends a lot of credence to the allegation that programmers are unsounding the money because it, it, is, it is dubious that what the programmers have done in the last few years has uh, performed in, in a degree that justifies the potential damage of that CVE. You know, meaning if, if the programmers had done nothing, let's say the CVE broke Bitcoin, um, then it would be very easily claimed that if the programmers had done nothing, it was better than having them do something because doing something led to the bug. Uh, which corrupted the system, but that's a bit of a tangent. So, like, independent of the technical issues, I actually don't think it'll be a problem because I think we'll just we'll have a collective memory loss about the things we said, um, and then we'll we'll have always believed that this was the thing we needed to do at the time of the emergency in order to not lose money. Um, but the first and foremost, uh, the federal government controls almost the entirety of the space uh, in terms of uh, its performance, and and that's fine. Um, it does that by providing the ramps into the system. So ACH and SWIFT being like the very obvious uh, government um, controls into the system. If they were to declare Bitcoin illegal tomorrow, what would happen is the exchanges would stop trading. Uh, they would halt those end ramps. There would be a panic sell. Uh, the price probably wouldn't go to zero, but it would go very, 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 very low. You know, you look, you, I don't know what it would be, under 100 bucks, under 10 bucks maybe. And uh, that would effectively kill the utility of the proposition because it's no longer liquid. So like if you, if in a market where Bitcoin's market cap was like a billion dollars, um, purchasing a million dollars with a Bitcoin um, very well might, you know, uh, sh shrink the price by like 90% and then it makes it uh, no longer usable for, for many types of uh, services that we like now. So I believe the federal government can just turn that off. That That's a button and they can hit it. And as soon as they do, uh, the space contracts uh, drastically. That's probably like the most likely thing that would affect us. Um, I guess from there, you know, there, there's all kinds of inner issues. Like, like people treat the devs like they're these, like, inhuman forces. But, like, the easiest attack vector in the space is just to compromise a human. And if it were me and I were nefarious, that would be where I would be focusing. And uh, that would probably involve, you know, like, I don't know, hiring, like, a prostitute to seduce one of them and, like, change their mouse out with a different mouse that has, like, a, a thing in there that would let me compromise the network. These types of things. Um, that would be another potential issue. Um, and, and that would be a little more nefarious because like, you, you could really do some major damage, I think, like, consistently with that. So, to the degree that would probably shock the market, there would have to be multiple attacks, I think. Um, but the other one, too, is like, I, I don't believe in this sort of like first mover advantage as a truth of the universe. All of the evidence would suggest that that's not true. We, we see that the volume is spreading out. We see a lot of the vendors are moving out of Bitcoin. And we see the exchanges are dropping uh, a, a lot of the primary support uh, for Bitcoin in lieu of competitors, or at least like trying to bring liquidity into all the other systems without having to go through Bitcoin. So like, it's possible that like a, a good meme would flip the, the market cap. So like, like the meme right now of gold is like a really great meme and it's done well and it may, it may always do well, but like world computer, it hit, you know, like 80% is good of a meme and it's conceivable to be that another meme might come out. Let, let's say like, I don't know, socialism or capital or like a, I don't know, communism trends. Like it's possible that a meme could exist that would accrue as, as much faith as, as gold did in that environment. Like it's not, to me, it's not a settled matter that the gold meme or that the first mover advantage meme is, is ordained and uh, promised to us to outperform uh, world computer memes or you know, whatever other injustice might maybe come up next. That's my that's my my opinion on it. I, I don't. I, I think the biggest one is that the government can shut it off at any time, and and by the way, like that's not like 
in my mind, like that's not something that should be perceived as like hating Bitcoin. It should be perceived as wanting to make Bitcoin better. We can we can then talk about the kinds of things that we need to do in order to prevent that from happening, uh, if if we acknowledge that that is a probable uh, risk. Yeah, I guess this is interesting to discuss. As it, it, it probably isn't, honestly. It's sensitive. Well, yeah. again, confidence and affirmation is like the, is like the the thing that you we're required to do generally. So, and, and that's perverse because like, that's not actually, that makes the system more fragile in my mind. If everyone is, so, so like what, so that's so like, okay, let's say, let's say Bitcoin isn't guaranteed success. Then the question, what, what can we do to ensure success? And we'll come up with answers like, oh, we should have a more robust um, local Bitcoin market. Like that would be something that we could all do. And, and then, well, then people are like, well, what's the incentive? My bank accounts get shut down. And, and then we can talk about that. We can, we can talk about the different ways that we can start doing more communal banking things. And if we were a little bit more uh, organized as a community, I could absolutely see uh, local Bitcoiners um, serving in a, a, like an Uber-esque kind of capacity, uh, a union of, of money exchanging, like in the same way that we kind of had in like Argentina uh, with their money exchanging systems. Like we could talk about those things. Uh, unfortunately, um, because of the, the incentives that are, exist, um, we can't plan ahead. Instead, it seems... Uh, we have to declare threats uninteresting or, um, you know, otherwise uh, slander or label the people who, who find threats as, as like being like antithetical to the team spirit, which I, which I find perverse. I really, I, I think that's a very poorly considered uh, aesthetic. So what is your view on the Bitcoin community? And do you think there is any way through which it would help and benefit the project much more than it already does. We're, we're unfortunately at this really terrible spot with the community now. I, I blame this no leaders meme for like killing the community. And it was very sad to me that that took off. And, and uh, you know, I, I get what, ha what happened was there was, a lot of, there was a lot of indignation, I think, in the general population over the status quo. I think a lot of people looked at the system and said, I'm not rising up the social hierarchy. This is a rotten system. I don't like our leaders. And so then Bitcoin came and said, well, leaders are bad. Uh, and like Andrea Santinopoulos really pamped that one, I think, more than anybody else. And like, I don't know, maybe that's not his fault. Maybe like, you know, whatever, he didn't know what he was doing. But then what ended up happening is we, we solicited a group of people who probably had every right to not like the incumbent system, who probably were very reasonable in their assessment of how it wasn't working for them. But then they came here and said, no, any form of leadership is bad. Um, all, all of this, mind you, while, while following a leader, uh, which is very hilarious. But because of, I think, that, um, that one meme, we've now polluted a lot of the discussion. So it's very hard for me to see how, without, I guess, maybe you know, your audience listening and other people starting to say, you know, say, say really what they think um, you know, in a way that is like, you know, mimetic and sticks and hold people accountable. But like we, we need rank. Like more than anything else, we need rank. And uh, that means that, that we need a hierarchy. And that means that we need to embrace leadership. And we need to have a, a, a better system for communicating shared goals. Uh, we, need a, a, we really need a superordinate goal. Uh, without one, we're going to be continually attacking ourselves. Um, and uh, we need to embrace official. Uh, people want to tell me that like, we have no leaders. And I'm like, okay, well, what, like, what Bitcoin do you run? Did you compile it yourself? Did you type it yourself? And then you know, they, they block you or they run away and hide. Um, and that's the end of that conversation. But the truth is that they absolutely ascribe 100% of their determination of what this is to the Bitcoin center. And I'm okay with that, but that means that the Bitcoin center now needs to start uh, stepping up to their role in the community. Um, that means that the Bitcoin center needs to declare um, basic things, you know, in accordance with any, any given governance standard. They, they need to do like, like these are solved problems. Like, you know, there's not, there's not many internets. There's not many TCPs. There's not many HTTPs. There's, there's all of these, Internet governance things have been resolved in the past, so all you have to do is follow the same template. But instead, um, it seems that the uh, the Bitcoin Center uh, won't do that, and uh, the, it, the the reasons why aren't terrible, but they aren't good either. And so uh, that leaves us in a really tough spot. And so that it's really that's why the Bitcoin dominance has faltered, and that's why a lot of people have like you look at like Brian Armstrong and these people, and the Bitcoiners are very quick to say like, okay, you're greedy, and it's that simple. But it's not that simple. 
uh, the, the truth is that these are people who want to provide solutions and have been told by a bunch of intolerance that they can't do that, that that is an attack on Bitcoin. And so those people rally to other communities. So like that's one of the reasons why I've gone to Monero and a lot of people gone to Monero is that we have like a blank slate where uh, we know their leaders because uh, Monero is what the leadership council says that it is. And, and like I don't really like to talk about that because frankly, Monero values privacy. And like there, there's a rank system and we respect these ethics. And, and as a result, lo and behold, we have a greater cohesion an understanding and uh, we, we have a march. And, uh, and frankly, you know, like I, I've been watching vendor uptick and vendor uptick in Monero has been really solid. It's, it's probably one of the healthiest uh, retail blockchains out there. And it's in no small part because of this. So, and, and granted, maybe, maybe, maybe retail is not what we want, but you know, it's also, you know, it's working as a store of value too. So like, I, I, you know, I don't know where it gets decoupled. And I don't even want to pant Monero. I, I really don't. I, I don't like to do that. It's just that, if you're asking for like an example of like how this problem has been handled elsewhere, that's, that's been my best example. Decred is probably also uh, as good, maybe even better, frankly. I, I've seen a lot of really good stuff happening with Decred uh, in, in this way. Like they've also done a really great job. I think I hold this unpopular opinion, which I, I think the only person with whom I talked about it, and it was a brief exchange of tweets, was Peter Todd. And we both agreed that Bitcoin needs cash to exist as a quick way to make exchanges and trades. And in order to make your Bitcoin more functional and fungible, you need to exchange in cash so you can use it everywhere. So it's useful to have local Bitcoin communities where you just go to that guy whom you know wants to buy some Bitcoin and you need to sell. And instead of going to exchanges and going all through all that KYC process, it's just useful to do quick exchanges. And it's maybe the opposite of the ideology that Bitcoin is going to replace fiat. And I, I guess that was a big part of the narrative while the fees were still low. And after the fees got higher, I guess we switched to this narrative of a store of value. It's going to be interesting now to see how it's all going to change with Lightning. But nevertheless, I still think that cash is useful. Even when, I guess, Lightning takes over and we no longer need the fungibility and privacy of cash. It's still useful to have cash as an antagonist and to point out to its failures in terms of becoming inflationary and say, it, unless we agree as a community and we run the node with this version of the protocol and we hold the majority, then we might just end up being governed as poorly as cash is yeah, you know, I, I, I'm a little skeptical at Lightning, I have to say. Like, there's a lot of inevitability. So the, the, the politics of inevitability permeate the space, but especially in Bitcoin. And it's just, it's just never been... Like, I like Lightning. I think it's great. But there's this, if you build it, they will come attitude. And I, I, again, I don't, I, I'm very skeptical that the technology matters. I, I think it's a nice thing to do. I think it's a great, great innovation and all that. But I don't believe for a moment that anyone's going to show up now that Lightning's here. In fact, I think that, if anything, um, it'll probably reduce confidence in Bitcoin because I don't, I don't see any, any carbon programming being done whatsoever. It, it's like a, the whole community has decided that they're going to do no carbon programming and they're going to let the, the Silicon programmers bring businesses, I guess, but that's not generally how things work. I'd like to see that happen. We'll see. Um, but I, the inevitability of it is generally... Uh, onerous, my experience in the space. Maybe this time will be different. But um, you know, things like like the ETF is inevitable. Um, things like uh, oh, I don't know. I mean, every ICO ever has been inevitable. Like the, <laughs> these things are these things are generally preempt failure more so than like trepidation. And I, I, I you know, the, I, the the thing is that like Bitcoiners need a a superordinate goal. I'm like big on this, meaning like if they don't have a utopia. 
then they won't they won't march in step because they don't they don't have a shared purpose and there isn't any rallying point for them to express their intent. And with lightning, it'll serve that it'll serve that superordinate goal need for a point, and it's fine for that now. Um, but I, I would predict, and I don't want this to be true. I just would predict that when when it is of some state of completion, what we will find is that it was merely uh, a, a nice tool, but one that needed marketing to go with it um, in order to succeed. And then I don't know that we are taking the marketing work any, at all seriously, unfortunately. Here is something which just came to my mind because I believe in the beginning of this interview, you said that you are somewhat conservative in political terms. Yeah, oh yeah. But all throughout your discourse, you are not really conservative in the sense that I believe you don't watch Fox News and don't necessarily agree with what they're presenting. I watch Fox News. I don't. I have a complicated, really. You know, I've worked in little ways with with media over the years, and like I know how the meat is made. So it's kind of like a. I see it in a different way. Anyway, you're much more open-minded than the average conservative. It's probably true. And I was about to ask you, do you think there is any place for Marxists and left-wingers and maybe hardcore communists who want, who want to achieve that great revolution in Bitcoin? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I actually I strongly suspect there are a lot of communists in Bitcoin already. Um, you, you can generally, it, it's, it's really easy to test. And then like people... People oftentimes find out that they're they're espousing communist beliefs in Bitcoin very quickly, um, but I mean, not yeah. But uh, I would actually think that uh, we would probably need or want to see like I actually talked about this at TabConf a little bit, um, very specifically. But I would think we're going to probably want or need like a communist or a socialist blockchain to put the people who have uh, a a perceived injustice uh, in the same uh, financial product. Uh, as it relates to capitalism, that's generally what happens. When there's like when there's some injustice trending, those people will invest in, in the injustice. So it seems like if we were on this communism socialism uptick, you would think that that would happen. I will say in the case of communism, it's a bit weird because like if you actually are like a like a like an actual real deal communist, you you would think that you might have some apprehensions about investing in anything. But my suspicion is that um, the, the communists will come up with something kind of weird that would then like, uh, like make their product compliant with the ideology. And I don't know what that weirdness would be, but I, I bet you'll be something creative. And, and, and like in terms of what should happen, I don't really care. Cause like I, for me, like I'm a big believer in just making money off of their, their like ignorance. I mean, that's the only way you could ever make money is really ignorance. Generally, it's very hard to make money any other way. Meaning like if you acknowledge like, is power. So generally as a, as a, any form of capitalist, you would, make your money off their stupid. And that, that's like a rote thing. So if, I mean, I'm not, I don't believe in communism. I think it's a really dumb policy. Uh, I understand how we got there uh, in, in many ways and whatever. But um, that being said, if someone wants to invest in communism and uh, because I thought communism was going to fail anyways, like might as well just sell them communism because that's what they're going to buy and they'll be happy. And that would be the end of that transaction. So like I wouldn't even be, I would even, I would even invest in a communism blockchain just to sell them the stupid product they want and make money on that. Because I think as an investor, that's what you, you would generally want to do. You don't, have to, you, don't, you don't have to believe in the product. You just have to like hold it and sell it for as long as you know, people wanted to buy it. That's, that's generally how that works. Yeah, but I guess also social Democrats are skeptical in regards to Bitcoin. And I think I've spoken to a few and it's inconceivable for them to hold any kind of asset that cannot be controlled by the government and over which there is no monetary policy that can be adjusted. And this has more to do, I guess, with um, the economic writings of Keynes, which they embraced to a greater extent. But it, it's so interesting to see that those who are farther to the left, as in communists and Marxists are much more willing to embrace something which they might consider to be the means of production or 
something that is so great that is going to grant them great power whenever that revolution takes place. And it, it takes me back to the idea that I, I come from a country which used to be communist until 1989, which is three years before I was born. But we had a revolution and we became capitalist. And before that point, some people like to say, oh, it was communism. But if you look at it through the right lenses, you're going to see that actually it was more like state capitalism. You had these elites who had all the resources and then you had the rest who were poor. So it was ideologically charged you are told all the time that you're part of this new system and this experiment which empowers the working class. But you still had rich people and you had elites and you had privileged folks. And I guess it's part of the human nature to be greedy. And the only system which seems to work on the long term is one where greed is encouraged and is only tempered to the extent that it doesn't resort to physical violence. Yeah, you know, I think in that frame, it, it's worth mentioning that like these ideologies are, are loose. They're not very, unfortunately, they're, they're not very, they're not like math. And so like a lot of people would say like, well, America is not really that like, like a true capitalist country. And I, I probably really agree with that even. Um, and a lot of people would, you know, say that like, I don't know, uh, communist Russia wasn't like a true communist country, and I'd probably agree with that too. So, like, there, there's how people present, and uh, oftentimes they present as something they're not. Uh, so, like, you know, I see a lot of Bitcoiners pre presenting as, as capitalists, but then like decrying anybody whose whose Bitcoin payment number doesn't have like it doesn't start with a three. Strikes me as like a weirdly weird, poorly cap capitalist like considering. Uh, you know, uh, issue. Um, but so like I would label them a communist in many ways because like they care more about the morality of, of your, of your bit receiving address, um, rather than like trying to make money off of people. Um, and, uh, you know, they would say that they aren't, and then you, you have the same kind of thing in reverse for the communists, I guess. So, so I, I don't know, like when, when you deal with the ideologies, you know, you have like the level of like delusion and expressed adherence and uh, then just the level of unknown. You know, there's so many different kinds of communism. There's so many different kinds of capitalism. So they, these are, they, be, they become like these rallying points, you know? Like, like freedom is kind of like not a real idea. It's just, a, it's just something that people seem to rally around. Um, even, even something like, like Christianity, let's say. Like, it's something like very holy. Uh, there, there's so many different kinds of Christianity. And like the true Christian doesn't exist. So... That, that, and all of these things, I guess that, that makes it very hard to really iron, iron down with precision uh, perhaps some of, these, some, of, some of these movements and their, their causes and intent. I guess that's helpful. I don't know. To some extent, I agree with you. But maybe the classifications of ideologies are much more complex than we like to admit. And sometimes we just look at some features on the surface and we say okay this bitcoiner is clearly a libertarian because he tries to establish or contributes to this economy that is being developed parallel to what the government does and he doesn't like you know to go with the herd and abide with the norm but there is an inner herd even though it's smaller and there is also a more or less socialist idea and the revolutionary mindset, which is much more akin to communism than to anything else. I don't think the extreme right has any idea of overthrowing the old system, or at least in canonical classifications where the extreme right is not the freest of markets, but Fascism. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that people generally align more by emotion than they do reason. It's, it's usually the ignorance that that really aligns people more so than the knowledge. So, like on, on like the extreme right, like there's probably an agitation that pre, pre, pre 
uh, exists any consideration of the platform. It's just that like they are united by some emotional uh, state that they find themselves in. And then like on the, and perhaps on the extreme left, they might be, I'm just throwing this out there. It's probably true, but who the hell knows? Maybe not. Uh, they're aligned uh, perhaps by like some degree of like anxiety more so than any ideological bent. And, and so then as you get towards the center, maybe reason starts to enter a little bit more. Um, and and it, it, then it's a, the chain in two is like in Bitcoin, th that would mean that, you know, like uh, back to like talking about Saif Dean, like the, the, he removes the ignorance by stating the passion for meat. So whereas before, like the interest of meat wasn't part of the identity, there was, there was an unknown there. Uh, there, was a, there was an agreed upon ignorance. And then the leader said, no, we are about the meat, at which time he's now alienated the vegetarians and who are no longer participating. So I think that like in these movements, like the, the sort of like the notion of what it is to be the true communist uh, only exists to alienate people that would otherwise be part of it. So if you said you were like loosely communist and we don't have any real specific policy around that, you would attract more people under your umbrella than if you said like, oh, okay, well, we, we're very communist and we believe in, you know, um, I don't, I don't know, ritualized ceremonies uh, around, you know, Marx, Marx's like figure. So, um, you know, we, we, I don't know, we eat celery or something um, like that would have less people to it. So like it, it's, it's perverse, but like the ideology in order to exist should generally be loose in order to uh, attract followers, which I think is why freedom has been so successful because freedom is completely undefined. It, it means doing whatever you want, I guess. But even that's kind of absurd because like you can't have, freedom without money. So that kind of invalidates the, even that. Um, but, but that's okay because if we all agree that freedom is good, then we'll, we'll amass around whatever the leader tells us. And I, I think that when I look at these like ideologies now, I generally think of it more in terms of the hierarchy than of the, of the content that people are, are speaking. Like that seems to be how things are shaping up lately in that sort of collective, collectivism world, seemingly. I used to think that the community is very homogenous in Bitcoin. But then I discovered that there are people who are Bitcoiners, more or less, like Jackson Palmer. And he has no problem calling himself a socialist, even though he's not a textbook socialist. He has shades of socialism. He complains about gender inequality at conferences and says, oh, these... Crypto conferences are filled with crypto bros, but at the same time, he is agnostic in relation to the idea that we need a government. So he's not really a socialist. He's more of a left anarchist or a social justice anarchist, if that makes any sense. But by definition, the left is more demanding of government intervention. But he is skeptical in relation to the need for a government. He, I guess he believes much more in the mob rule or some kind of established democracy, I guess, which makes decision collectively. And you also have people like the other guy with the name Vlad, who is much more famous than me, Vlad Zamfer, who yeah. works for Ethereum. And a lot of times he likes to... At least this is my take on his activity. He likes to stir outrage and present ideas that are very unpopular just for the sake of it, to test the water, maybe. I remember about a month ago that he posted an article in which he tried to crucify Nick Sabo and say that his law, as in he labeled it everything that he presented in terms of values is wrong and you should have blockchains which are completely compliant with law. And his terminologies were vague in the sense that he didn't define what law means because depending on the jurisdiction, you're going to find a different law and it's difficult right. to be compliant with everybody. It's difficult for states to get along with each other and maybe agree on the condition of a convict, but in the case of blockchains and what you should be doing with smart contracts, that's even more difficult. But even him, I guess ideologically, he's more to the left if you follow his tweets and 
I, I guess if you were to classify him from the point of view of somebody who is a hardcore libertarian and has conservative worldviews, he's kind of a snowflake. He's easy to offend. He likes to pose as a victim. But also, he's pretty smart. That's not something I can take away from him. But I pointed out to his example and Jackson Palmer's because they are members of this community, of this space, and they are not easy to classify in ideological terms. You cannot say they follow Seyfedean. You cannot say that they follow Vitalik, whatever that means. They are unique in their own right. And I, I guess our small bubble would be so much more interesting if we had more people who express something or express some kind of individuality. You're supposed to be decentralized, but then you're, you're being educated in terms of which values you should be embracing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's always hard being in the space now with the avenues we have because, like, I, I, I've met so many people that are definitely not part of, like, what the mainstream perception of Bitcoin is. Like, like really group, like great people, like, like mom and pop types that are, like, you know, just, like, elderly maybe, and they have grandkids, and they just, you know, they want to, like, invest some money in this thing, and they don't know anything about it. And uh, there are a lot of people like that. But I think because of the social media algorithms, like you're, you're never online, you're never going to see like moderate opinions and like constructive resolutions passed. So I, I've been pushing for IRL now. Like you got to meet IRL with people and see who's, who's willing to like show up and put a little, little sweat equity in. Uh, but um, you, you, like it's very hard to have a one-sided doc, like dialogue with people. And it seems like if you're a reasonable person, you're, you're going to generally meet with crickets out there in this space, generally. And, you know, I get it. And this gets into our, our journalism discussion. Like, nobody, nobody wants to read the good news. Nobody wants to, like, know that, like, oh, the, the hospital down the street has added a new ward. And now, like, I don't know. I saw, I saw a news article the other day about how cancer rates are going down. And that was great, but, like, it didn't get much traffic. So, like, it, it's a little, a little shitty right now because of that. Because I, I think that you're probably right that it, probably most Bitcoiners are pretty reasonable and want to work together. But it seems like the intolerant minority is dominating the discussion. I think this whole discussion that we have had during the podcast feels a lot like criticizing aspects of Bitcoin, seeing how it can be broken and talking about actors who are influential, but in a toxic way in the long term. And maybe I should ask you to say something positive before ending this. Like, what do you appreciate the most about Bitcoin and which feature of it do you think gives it the advantage that keeps it ahead of the curve or most relevant and most likely to succeed? Yeah, good question. I guess, I mean, I appreciate the liquidity. Like, that's just at the end of the day, that is the most important thing for blockchain to have and do. And uh, I, I, I do, I, I appreciate most of the drama too, actually. I, I actually do think we not only need it, we want to encourage it. And I mean, people don't put together that like the, the volume and the liquidity is a reflection of the drama. If there was nothing interesting happening, there would be no volume. So I actually do like the drama, but despite all, the, all the, this sort of like criticism, it, it's really just the indignation and the intolerance and like the aversion to literacy, I think, that uh, I don't like. Everything else, I, I, these people should all be encouraged to do what they're doing just without that, and then we'd be fine. So I, I, appreciate, I, I appreciate even the people in the space. I do. I really do. There's a lot of people who've sacrificed a lot, and I appreciate the liquidity. That's the best thing about Bitcoin. No, uh, I guess yes, we, at this point we have redeemed ourselves for spitting venom <laughs> all around. People got to get out of their comfort zone, man. You know, like if you have a specialization in life, you should know that like that, that 
the journey is fun because it's difficult. And the rewards are there because we've outsmarted nature, not because we've chosen to ignore it. That's, that's, that's what my lessons have been in life. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we're all wrong. And maybe that we are wasting our lives <laughs> just doing something which is irrelevant in the grand scheme of things and the universe doesn't care. And maybe that there is no entity to care about our deeds in this life and we are going to end up in a hole in the ground. I mean, it sounds like I've converted you to this like uh, non-anthropogenic thinking or something. I mean, the, you know... Uh, uh, like a, yeah, a sort of dystopian and uh, sad look on the earth might be that. But I don't know. You gotta dip in and out of it. It's it's good to see the world like outside the moral lens. Like, you know, like if you look at a cup, it, it, as soon as I say the word cup, now you know what the intent of the thing is. It's for drinking. But if, if you looked at it like an alien might, it would just be a piece of like porcelain that has a, a strange geometric pattern and it wouldn't have any intent. It would, it would just It would just be like a rock of, of a sort. And sometimes when you, when you flip between those two modes of, of perspective, you learn things that help you navigate the world better. That's my philosophy. Yeah, and I guess you're very relaxed and you know, you're just being yourself, which is always admirable. Thank you. We should not be turned into NPCs. I, I guess that was a meme a few months ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, you can't help... I mean, like, you, you have to be some level of NPC. Like, you know, you, you're born, and, and you don't choose the language you speak, and, like, what a coincidence. You just happen to speak the same language as everybody around you. And, and it starts from there. And, like, what a coincidence. You happen to, you know, listen to the same music and wear the same clothes. So we, we are communal animals, and that's inescapable. But we got to keep it in balance, and that got out of whack for a while there. Do you have any studies in philosophy? Yeah, a lot. I, you know what? I tell people, I'm not, I'm not an expert at this by a lot, very armchair at best. But I tell people, uh, really, in this space, you should, it's, a, it's a long series, but it's excellent. There's the Yale uh, course on political science. And it's the philosophy of political science. And I think if people start there, that would make them just so much happier and in, in more powerful in life if they, if they just watched that one series alone. And then from there, uh, Rick Roderick, I think is his name, he's a great, like, great lecturer in the 90s who really they started talking about some of the more modern concepts in philosophy. And then, then from there, you can start figuring out what the hell you want to actually start reading and looking into. And people really should spend more time on that. Instead of looking at charts, that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Charts are, oof. Charts, charts are... <laughs> The charts are gambling. <laughs> All of this feels like gambling sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, it, it, it got in balance, you know? Like, it's, it, it's it, you know, America was a gamble once. And uh, we, we happen to be born in a time when it's a certainty. But there was a time when it was a risk no different than Bitcoin. So it's interesting that it's productive. you turn out to be the more positive one at the end of the interview. In, in the beginning, you're the skeptic, and now you're highlighting some positive and optimistic aspects, which, which is great. We have had a balanced conversation. People don't understand. To be a good skeptic, you actually have to have the most faith in the system. I don't, I don't know why that is. It is very perverse. Like Peter Todd is like a cynical and, and I, I, it's weird because, like, he's a very difficult person. I don't, I don't think he likes me at all. But, like, he, you can't take away from him that he has the most faith in things. So, like, it's very weird. People forget that. I, I don't know why. It's like if, if like, if, if, if I can share with you the skepticism, that means I've, I've kind of, like, gone through it a bit, and I understand that it has a place. It doesn't mean it's the end of things. It means it's the start of things. And uh, I, I don't know if that's the scientist that's in me left over from my programming days or what. That's the way I see it. So I was about to ask you which philosophers you read and which ones influenced you the most. Yeah, you know, the, on the honest truth, I'm not, I'm, I'm not smart enough to read through the vast majority of these texts. I mean, like Paul Sports will tell you that all you need to know is Plato 
you should read through Plato. It's very easy uh, to go through. Even like on Wikipedia, I think they have a lot of his like his stuff, uh, lectures and such. Uh, you can find it anywhere, and uh, and that's good. Um, on the subversive side, you know, there's some real wild stuff out there. Like it'll totally change your perspective on things. You got to watch it with philosophy. Um, you know, Derrida's great. And he's obviously trending right now. Um, he, may be, he may be, you know, the one who starts the end of times. I have no idea. But he's got some really cool stuff. He may be completely wrong. I, I don't know. Um, you know, Foucault is amazing. Just amazing. I have no idea if he's right or wrong. I'm not that smart. But, like, he will change your perspective on things. And I think, I think you know, it, it makes you a better person at the end of it. Um, and, and uh, geez, I don't know. From there, you know, there's, there's the classic... Heidegger, uh, there's a few, you know, there's a few people up and down the line that I would probably recommend in the classical sense. I, you know, go through and see what you find. The post, I mean, the postmodernism is really very relevant in this space. This, this is like a, a barnyard. Oh my God, that guy's amazing. Love him. <laughs> Love him. Can't say enough good things about him. Um, he's probably said more predictive information about blockchain than anybody I've, I've read in a long time. Um, and I, and I mean, Bajra is like easy to read, but it's hard because like you get you get these little poems and stuff, and you sit there and you think about them. And like, geez, that is kind of weird. Um, but you, like, he he has a couple of really great points uh, that that I think absolutely apply to this space. Um, his work on on uh, simulacrums, I think, are ex- express uh, like very very poignant uh, in the blockchain space. He he's very he's very cynical, but he also has like that that same level of optimism. Like his point his point is that the utopias always suck. I think they always they, 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 you get to the utopia and it's horrible. It's like every fucking time he's kind of right. Like, like you got to consider like this, this America or this world that we're in, like every, every problem that you have it is in fact the utopia that your parents set out to achieve. And if like you showed this to like 300 generations back, they would have been like, that's the, that's the utopia. And like, and then here you are. And like, you're just like, you're pissed off because you're like, I don't know, you're a wage slave or something, right? Like whatever, the, whatever, like the problem is. But like what Baudrillard's point is that like, well, fine, the utopias always suck. They're, they're needed, but they suck. So what you should consider is that you live in the utopia, and this is, in fact, the best of all possible worlds. The, like the friction that you seek is better than any other world that you could possibly exist in. And like, like that's, that's like very redeeming to me. I, I, I use that as even like a, a moment of like appreciation. So like in the case of Bitcoin, like I, I return to that. It's like, okay, well, I guess of, of all like the different Bitcoins that could have been, like this is the one that we have. It's, it's clearly the best of them all. And so, so we've at least got that going for us. And I guess it probably gets better from there even. Um, but, but like he, he, has, he, he has some very like dire, his point, I mean, he's got, it's a whole conversation, but his point is kind of like that we've really lost a lot of the, of the meaning that brought us here and we'll, we'll never get it back. He's probably right about that. Uh, you know, like, like culture effectively got homogenized in a way that is irreversible. And so now... The, the net result of that probably is that we have less meaning in our lives. And that does seem to be fairly well corroborated, I think, in the modern era. So I don't know, maybe somebody will come after him and say he was completely wrong and here's why and things will change. But he's worth reading because he has like this veneer of optimism that's unparalleled uh, in his exploration of like the sort of dystopias that we've all come to love. Now I think I understand you better <laughs> by the philosophers that you read. Thank you. I didn't get much into the postmodernists, especially the French ones, but I did read from Foucault about governing yourself, which was a series of lectures which he held at Collège de France, which is a public institution in Paris where you can sign up as a professor and the rule is that you can never do the same class for two years in a row. So you always have to present recent research and anyone can attend it. There is no sign up process. Anyone on the street cool. can just walk into the classroom and listen to you and take notes. And that was never a formal book. It was just based on the notes that some students have taken and some of them have recorded on tape the lectures and it was transcribed and made into a book after his death. I think there are more books of Foucault which were released after his death from lectures than he actually took the time to write. Yeah, he had a ton of content and yeah, his tragic death was sad and all of that. 
he, his, like, I think his governance, I felt like he was very inspired by, by Nietzsche in, in, in a sort of self-actualization, I remember right, kind of way. Which, that, that, there's a lot of problems with that uh, theory. Like, like, like most of his work, I guess. It, it's not something that isn't worth learning. It's, it, it, they're just, it, it just kind of introduces a lot of scaling issues. As Jordan Peterson has like, kind of pointed out, to his credit. But I still love it, because it's, it's an exploration of thought that you won't find elsewhere. I think he was a textbook contrarian, and he tried for most of his life to become relevant in the kind of conservative environment which was based mostly on time-tested and proven methods of research. And he just came and said, you know, prisons are bad and it was better back in the day in medieval times when they were just hanging people in public. Yeah. And saying hospitals are bad institutions because they isolate you and they're not what they should be. I guess he had a problem with public institutions and the way governments were treating them. He had problems with the police. I don't know, maybe being gay in that time affected his worldview. Oh, definitely, I think. He felt ostracized, maybe. But also, in terms of writing about governance, and there are some points that may be relevant with Bitcoin, as he talks about autonomy and how you can rule yourself, because there is the rule of the government that you should be following as a citizen, but the, then there is the issue of creating your own governance or ruling those around you. And this goes back all the way to Aristotle, who wrote in politics that the household is the first form of polity and being, at the time it was all about the husband being the head of the family. And that was the way of conducting politics. And in their culture, not being able to have a prosperous and successful family was an indicator that you are not actually able to maybe be a good leader. But at the same time, they had that electoral system by lots and they were drawing um, I'm not sure what they were called. It's almost 5 a.m. here. I'm tired. But they were doing a lottery to determine their leaders. And I guess most of the political works at the time were a criticism of the democracy that they were having and a way to figure out what else is out there to improve on the system. Yeah, you know, it's something I would tell anybody who's looking into the, the like the French postmodernists. Like, I'm not really that qualified here, to, you know, preface this, but like the the way to read these things, if you ask me, isn't in terms of uh, a, a form to emulate. Like, you shouldn't read Foucault's advocacy as something you should do, but you should read it to understand what others do, um, and and then you can decide if you also want to do that. And so, like, for, I mean, his points I, I think are very well made. Um, on like the the evils of like modern prisons, let's say, because it used to be that if you if you performed a crime, you would you would have your you would have your recognition in society for your task. So like the, the notion of the martyr is completely like gone from society in, in any terms of like positive light. But it's it's conceivable that like we like we could have martyrs that would be like very virtuous. So like you think of things like um, and we do have them like like uh, Ross Albright. Of of uh, Silk Road, he he does he will never have his time to shine now. He'll be stuck in a cage in a hole. Whenever see him, and every effort will be made to keep him under wraps. And in and in that way, he does not get a negotiation with society. He does not get to be heard in any real way. And he, his sacrifice that he will he will be bearing, it will be completely unrewarded. Whereas in the old style, your your sacrifice would be this gigantic display in the center of town where they would lob your head off and it would just be like very like visceral and like there would be a feeling by the entire town for your loss. And that acted like a, a bit more of a, a check and balance on power. And it probably added more legitimacy to like the sacrifice of the damned. And so like, I'm, I'm at least sympathetic to that. Not, not so much as like we should, we should return to that, 
But in terms of, well, yeah, he's right that that the uh, the effects that 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 old system had on people was probably pronounced. It probably existed, and it it probably would predict their their behaviors if repeated today, maybe. Like that's how I kind of read through this stuff, and that adds value to me. Like I think like Paul told me, like there's a lot of bullshit in postmodern. I'm like I'm sure there is, but but I can tell you for sure that I've learned this and this. And I'll be damned if that doesn't end up being predictive about how other people do things. And it's not like how I think I should behave or what I should do, but it, it is a useful guide to prediction. Um, and, and like for anybody listening to this, like you should ask yourself, like, do you believe that might makes right? And, and there isn't any good answer to it, um, but it's, it's predictive. So like I can, I can tell you that like, yeah, if I had a guess, you know, what's going to happen on something? I'll probably bet on the person who has power. Do I believe that that's like the way it should be or the way I should live my life? No, but it's, it's a useful thing to understand about making predictions on how the world will work. Like, so th- like that's kind of the way to go into some of the philosophy stuff, if you ask me. Also, I guess there are books which teach you pieces of information. There are books which show you how to do stuff. And there Absolutely. are books which develop your thinking and help you think, if that makes any sense. They don't fill your brain with actions and characters and plots. It's all about reading that stuff and developing some dimension of your thought process, putting yeah. situations that you haven't thought of before. And I don't know, if you read Plato and the dialogues, I think that's the best introduction to debating. If you, you are a debater, but you never read Plato, I think you're in a big disadvantage. Agreed. Because you get to understand all points of view. And you have a character which voices every kind of opinion that can be had on every topic discussed. From this point of view, I think he was a genius. He was brilliant. I think oh, Aristotle yeah. was superior in terms of analytic philosophy and trying to describe everything. And I don't know, this Western culture is just incredible. If you read the Chinese works like Confucius, is that how you pronounce his name? Confucius. Confucius. It's just proverbs and words of wisdom that you can interpret according to your own judgment and finding your own wisdom in them. But with Aristotle and Plato, it's all about analyzing and trying to find all the details in everything and breaking the arguments into every faucet there is. And I think that's what gave us the advantage, I guess, in the long term. That's why it was the West which generated all the capital and ended up taking over the world in a cultural way. And that's why the industrial revolution started in England because people got to read all these great works. And I guess it's also because of the separation from the Catholic church and stuff like that, but that that's not the subject of our discussion. I guess philosophy is great no matter what you do because it, it teaches you how to think and how to understand others. And that's essential. Yeah, agreed. I agree with all that. I, I think I think uh, like Deleuze, his like point on philosophy was that it, it's the framework for for categorization of the world. Like you, you you can consider that you're like this stimulus receiver, and and while like in the we have like the social conditioning now in the modern era to where like we have like these realms of thought that are like math and science and art and these things. Um, but like here in Bitcoin, like the realms are really very poorly defined. Like you're just this stimulus receiver. So yeah, you start categorizing it. You say, okay, well, no, that's technical, that's social, that's governmental, that's uh, you know sociological. But I mean, really, it goes like way deeper than that in terms of categorization. And so I, I think that people discount the value of componentizing uh, their world and or uh, making you know structures out of out of the stimulus in, in general. I think that people take for granted that it's been done for them already. And then they show up in Bitcoin where the categorization has not been done and they're at a disadvantage, I think. Yeah. And I guess labeling in general is counterproductive. It can be time-saving 
if you're in a hurry or you're just shallow by your nature. But there's always more to the picture than meets the eye. And I guess for as advanced as sociology has become and or psychology or these sciences which try to create categories for everything and every type and even invent conditions to make anyone mentally ill some way. For all these advancements, there are so many exceptions to the rule and so many elements that make us human that um, philosophy is a much more noble and useful pursuit in itself. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, it's it's a weird it's a weird journey, and you can go on that journey as deep as you want. And uh, if you're at least if you're smart enough, it's a very challenging one. Uh, it's you know, it, it's uh, it's been fun for me. I'd recommend it. Yeah, I, I, yeah. If you're a Bitcoiner, it helps you analyze the space a little better. Check out Baudrillard. That guy that guy predicted the ICO thing like way before. It happened. It's like a, I predicted ICOs in like the 80s. It's like, it's like amazing. Do you know exactly which book? Uh, sim, simulacrum. I mean, even if you just read like the Wikipedia entry, it's like very like kind of like, whoa. Uh, it was a simulacrum and uh, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a lot to it, but like the, the gist, I'm looking it up right now. I should simulacrum and simulacrum and simulation. There you go. Simulacrum and simulation. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, I mean, humans create like these huddles where like there's a morality that gets you higher up in, in, the, in the hierarchy. And in many ways, the, high, the, the moralities that do that are kind of like arbitrary and weird. And so like in, in the modern era, we've had like these simulation and aspects. They're everywhere, really. And uh, you can't escape them. And as a result, you see things like, like the ICO huddle, uh, if you will, for like the hierarchy involved in that, that mania. Uh, was very much an emulation of IPOs and of like stocks. So like if when the ICO thing happened, like you showed up and nobody really knew what the rules were, but in order to move up the hierarchy, the strategy was to pretend uh, that you were dealing with an IPO and you saw people that moved up the hierarchy did that to a, a degree that was uh, fairly significant compared to the people who didn't. So if you talked about the ICO, even though the ICO wasn't a company, didn't have like employees and have money coming in, like a bajillion reasons it's not a company, or at least it's a very feeble one. Um, if you ignored that, if you presented ignorance to those things and instead uh, developed a comprehension around the, the analogy uh, uh, to um, stocks, then you, you moved up into the system and then that reinforced uh, that skill with others. And, uh, and it really kind of gets weirder from there. I mean, in many ways, that's what happened with Bitcoin too. Like Bitcoin was this gold simulacra. So in order to move up the hierarchy in Bitcoin, you would say you do basically what Safe and Dean did, exactly what Safe and Dean did, where where you created um, these analogies that uh, even though like these are you know bits, they're they're ones and zeros. Uh, they, they don't have any space. They don't have seventy nine protons in the electric in, in the in the uh, seventy protons in the nucleus of the atom. In fact, it doesn't even take up space. Um, it, despite all of that, if you emulated a form and you and you uh, presented um, narratives and stories around that form of gold, then you would move up the social hierarchy. And that's what, that's what Safe and Dean did, unbeknownst to him. This is why I call him like the quintessential postmodernist, because he really is. And uh, he's revered because he made a case for the simulation uh, of Bitcoin as gold. And uh, there's really, again, there's like, there's a lot more to it than just that. But like that, that's a, like in my mind, one of the, one of the best books in the space is Simulacra and Simulation uh, by Baudrillard. And I've actually read the book, I only like, read the cliff notes. But you get the idea. Again, I'm not like a real, I'm a, I'm a pseudo-intellectual who uses MS Paint. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Pseudo-intellectuals who use MS Paint talk yeah. with it and can have long conversations which are actually on point and eloquent. Yeah. Well, it's that. predictive, too. Like, I could, if anybody wants to be, like, at the top of the hierarchy here, it ain't hard. You know, like the blueprints are done. Like now, now it'll evolve. Like that, the, the thing about the, these things is like they work until everyone knows that's the rule and then the rules change. So we'll see what the next one is. But like that's probably still hitting it right now. Okay, it's about five. You were like an hour over my time too. Here. I gotta make dinner. It's 10 o'clock at night. 
<laughs> okay, this was really great, and I'm happy that we got to talk. Just so you know, this is part of the second season, and I release all episodes all at once. The first season had ten episodes. I want this to have also ten episodes, and I will publish them probably at the end of March when I'm done interviewing people. Giacomo Zucco, whom you mentioned, I guess will also be a part of this, and also Pierre Rochard. Awesome. I like Pierre. And, uh, and Giacomo. We butt heads, but I like him. And I he hope I get Seyfedin to some time, but I, I don't think he likes me that much. Anyway, also, I have this system of... All you got to do is, all you got to do is, is like talk about the gold. Just, just tell him that like the, uh, the ancient Egyptians uh, created their pyramids out of Bitcoin. Guarantee you, he'll love you. <laughs> You'll get the interview that way. I'll think about it. Yeah, yeah. And I also have this system of donations. So if anybody, I, I mean, every participant, every guest has his own Bitcoin address. And if anybody donates to them, they're going to get 50% of the donation. Oh, that's, that's very nice. I appreciate the offer. I, I don't think I will take you up on that. I would rather you have the money. You did all the work, but thank you. Oh, you can choose a charity or something. All right, we'll see. We'll deal with it when the, the time comes. But it's very unlikely as the first season only got like $10 and I have to split it <laughs> okay. with John Carvalho. <laughs> Funny. But yeah, I guess Bitcoiners are not very generous during bear markets or I just suck at doing podcasts. It's bear markets. You're doing a good job. We'll see. Again, you know, let's see what people want. Sometimes, sometimes good content is not well rewarded, unfortunately. Sometimes it is. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, I do it also for myself to learn something new. As uh, Good. I have an excuse to talk to people. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't care. This is a cover-up for me nourishing my brain. I get that. All right, bud. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up, head over. My, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm going to make myself some dinner. But I enjoyed the conversation. Is anything I'm else uh, you need for me? Yeah. We Maybe all done? You can invite me to your podcast, but that's a lot of wishful thinking. Well, I, I, I'm not doing the podcast right now. So when I spill it back up again, I would love to do it. Let me see. I'm, I'm taking a break at the moment. I'm trying, I'm trying to do more IRL stuff. We'll see. Okay. So thank you very much for this. Thanks, buddy. Tag me on it when it comes out. I'll retweet and all of that. Much appreciated. Thank you.